Hey, Domar Cross here with Real Advisors, and this is The Real Deal. Uh, today, I have none other than the great Natalie uh, coming to us from Miami, Florida, South Florida. And this is where she does her real estate deals and transactions. And I wanted to have her share some of the things that she's doing right now to uh, survive and thrive in this marketplace right now. Uh, we were all just in Puerto Rico just a few weeks ago, masterminding, uh, sharing some strategic action plans, tips, ideas, and things that we're going to be doing to pivot our business and adapt to this new economy that we're entering into. And I think everything that's been going on since Puerto Rico, right? It's like new information every single day since then. And the situation has gotten worse since then and buyers backing out, lenders backing out of deals. So uh, that's the narrative and that's the information, that's the feedback we've been getting from uh, not only some of our community members, but also people outside of our community as well, just real estate investors in general. And that's why I wanted to do this call is to uh, obviously see what some of our members are doing right now to keep their businesses going, what adaptions they're doing in their business, uh, to keep things moving forward with positive, positive momentum and talk about some of the deals that you have going on right now, because there's also talk that, Hey, while buyers are backing out of deals and lenders are backing out of deals, there's still investors that are crushing it right now with buyers that are still buying deals. So while there are buyers backing out, there's still buyers that are buying while lenders are backing out, there's still lenders that are lending. And so some of us get caught in this mindset and, and, you know, get caught up in the negative narrative that's going on out there. And it scares us, makes us worry about, you know, the viability of our business. Is, is it the right thing to be doing right now? And, and so while there are a lot of new members coming into our community, a lot of people outside that have lost their jobs, looking at real estate as a possible option, I want to share like, yes, this is a perfect business to be in right now. While there are businesses going out of business, while there are others going bankrupt, uh, there are certain businesses that are thriving right now. And thankfully for us as real estate investors, our industry is one of those that is thriving, can thrive. And if positioned properly, if, if you have the right knowledge and the right information and you're deploying the right strategies in this market right now, you can absolutely dominate while also helping uh, homeowners as well as the situation gets worse. So uh, Natalie, thank you for joining me today. Uh, so happy to have you on here. And I wanted you to share first off, you know, uh, talk about yourself a little bit, your business, what you do, and uh, what did you do specifically to adapt to uh, the current situation and an economy that we're in right now? Yeah, so thank you for having me, Delmar. It's always great to give back value. Um, so a little bit about me. So my name is Natalie Delgado. Uh, I am local to the South Florida market. So that's Miami-Dade, Broward, Palm Beach County. I also virtually wholesale in North Carolina, in Charlotte, and in the Triad area. Um, so I guess um, I guess I'll start off with you know in the beginning when you know all of this crisis hit. It was it it was um it wasn't tough but it was scary right it was scary because it it was almost like everyone it was almost like the end of the world you know but and I have to be honest and just share like you know I was very emotional um and I was um it, it was scary and I was scared you know but um once you kind of change the mindset and that's what I did it's just like there's always an opportunity in every single cycle, right? Um, that's what I shifted to right away. I would say about 10 days into this whole uh, lockdown, I completely shifted my marketing. One of the first things that I did was I let go of any properties that were already too high. So here in Miami, we do get away with a lot of properties that aren't, let's say, um, great flip potential, but they'll work for somebody because there's so many people that have cash here. So because it is a major market. Um, so the first thing that I did was I, I let go of those properties. I didn't want to spend any more marketing dollars on dispositions on those properties, knowing that they weren't, you know, that wasn't the market that we were in. The second thing that I did right away was just um, mark, aim to market for lower price properties. So I, you know, I talked to my main buyers and the main consensus that I kept getting is, that they were scared and buying, but they would buy something that was cheap, you know? 
So usually I aim for properties three for with full market value of 300,000. I switched it right away to mark properties uh, full market value of 200,000. And that's what I, I've been honing in on. Um, since here in South Florida, it's a little bit more difficult to get those type of properties right away. All my marketing efforts went to North Carolina and that's where we've been getting a lot of our new deals under contract. So it was just, you know, quickly shifting. Um, and, you know, North Carolina is a market where the properties are so relatively cheap from a rental standpoint, they always make sense to people. So that, that's what's really been working um, with us on, on that side. Um, and then uh, honestly, we've, I've been seeing a lot of the benefits, I guess you could say, out of, you know, all this bad situation, um, you know, but, I, before I had a physical team here in Miami and a big virtual team, um, I hire out of Columbia. But what this has really forced us to do is one, come together and, you know, really streamline the communication because there's really not so much that in-person contact anymore. And it, I mean, it's been going so well. I don't even know if I want to go back to my, my office. <laughs> isn't going so well. Everyone enjoys it. The virtual team definitely enjoys it because they, they're in a lot better communication. And um, so I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to go back to my office. It's kind of been like um, kind of a, a bit of a blessing in disguise, um, especially cutting out that overhead if I do, you know, put the office. Um, as far as what's really been helping us now that we have a completely virtual team, every morning I have an acquisitions meeting at 8.30 and then at 9 a.m. we have a dispositions meeting. And I greatly see the difference as far as our accountability, getting more stuff done in less time and overall just like the communication. Um, and it's also allowed me to um, hire new people um, that you know are virtual. So I'm currently in the process of um, hiring a cold caller that I'm quickly gonna bring her up to acquisitions. Uh, I have one acquisitions um, manager that is in Colombia and he's getting his contracts, you know, and obviously that that's going to be at a lot lower cost for us. Um, it's also really focused me on um, streamlining our training process and just almost systemizing everything. I've uh, honestly I've been a lot more organized now that we've been under this lockdown. So it's been a bit of a blessing in disguise. As far as our deals, um, the first two weeks, it was, it was really slow, you know, uh, but now like we're ramping back up and we have a, a really good deal now that um, we're, so currently it's a property, we have it on short sale. We got it approved for 145,000 and we have buyers that want to pay us 194. it. Nice. That's awesome. So, what market is that one in? That is in Broward, so South Florida. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Broward. Awesome. And you, you, I want to go back to something you said earlier is you, you said you've transitioned to more of a virtual operation now, obviously, because everyone is forced to work from home. Uh, we've been forced to be virtual and remote um, pretty much immediately as soon as we got back from Puerto Rico. Uh, we were for, forced into that situation. And uh, thankfully for us, our business is one of those that's easy to run virtually. We don't have to personally go see the houses ourselves. We don't have to um, inspect them at all. And uh, there's a lot of things that we can do virtually. We can close deals over the phone. We can get contracts executed uh, virtually. So it's a beautiful thing. And just like you, uh, we were an events company. We had to adapt and pivot very quickly because most of our uh, marketing was targeted to doing live events um, in big hotels and so forth. And uh, again, overnight, the you know, CDC says, hey, you can't do events for eight weeks with 50 or more people. We had to cancel five different events just like that. That's where our revenue came from. And overnight, we had to pivot very quickly to a complete virtual operation. And we just did a couple of events the last few weeks virtually. We just finished our commercial uh, empire training event. Uh, we have another one coming up this weekend. We did another one the week before that. And the results so far, we're looking at our, ourselves, like my partners and I are having discussions, like, I don't know if we'll ever want <laughs> to go back to a live format again. 
Uh, we no longer have to worry about paying thirty, sixty, a hundred thousand dollars to put on these events. Depending on the size of the event, of course, uh, we no longer have to have that overhead budget. We can do everything online. And the funny thing is, the students. What I also love about this is this situation is forcing people and helping to train people for us on how to digest information virtually. Um, it's preparing them for online training more. So uh, this form of training, uh, this format is becoming more acceptable now. Uh, so doing events virtually and, and so forth, um, I think is gonna be our future going forward. I don't know if I ever wanna do a live event anymore. I mean, we probably will. I'm not gonna say we're not gonna completely do it, but um, at least we know we don't have to. And so that's cool that you were able to innovate. It sounds like you're innovating in your own business. Uh, going to the virtual operation and you're fine-tuning other parts of the business that were not as fine-tuned before. You're getting rid of a lot of the fluff, a lot of overhead, a lot of the expenses. You're focusing on what's working right now, uh, which is a great thing. I also want to touch on, so you can clarify for me, what was it exactly that you did to shift your mindset? Because you, um, And I thank you for your honesty as well, by the way, because um, you can come on here and, you know, like everything's great right now, but I, I thank you for sharing that. No, I was scared out of my mind for the first couple of weeks uh, because I was, you know, you were worried. What was it that you were worried about? And then specifically, what did you do to that was that switch in your mindset for you? Well, I feel like, you know, I, I think it's also coming from a woman's point of view. So first it's just like, for me, it's just like honored where I was at. I also got into another business um, in the midst of all this, you could kind of call it a side hustle where um, it's medical supplies. So I'm on the phone a lot with hospitals. So you're like hearing firsthand how much supplies that they need. And it, you know, that hit even, even deeper, right? The, the fact that there's a, such a high demand is obviously because there's a lot of people that are sick. Um, so you yeah. know, it was just like coping coping with those uh, feelings. Um, and then after that, it's just like, listen, like I can't do anything, you know, about what's going on. I can only make the, um, I can only make the best of it, right? So that happened for me on a Saturday. And really what I spent the day doing was just writing down, you know, the possible opportunities um, that is in my business, right? So obviously a lot more motivated sellers, which we we're starting to see that at first, you know, there was a lot of fear, I um, mean, people get paralyzed by fear. So um, they weren't able to make decisions, but now they're, you know, we're having more and more sellers that are having interesting conversations with us and are, are willing to sell again, right? So I guess like for that two weeks, again, it was kind of at a halt, but now like we're really, really getting a good outcome on our marketing. Um, second, it's also the buyers, you know, it, it's just more filtering. So one of the things I actually did that really helped um, is that I took my buyers list and I sent out an RVM, um, saying like, Hey, it's Natalie. I just wanted to let you know, I have some deals, um, that I'm selling. If you're, if you're still buying in this market, give me a call. Right. And I tracked those callbacks. So even though I couldn't get all the callbacks in, I knew who was buying and then I retargeted. And those are the people I reached out now that I have properties under contract. So at least I got people to answer, like raise their hand and be like, yeah, I'm still an active buyer, you know? Um, and then just focusing on what they, what they need, you know, which the common consensus was that everybody just wants cheap property. So literally all of our spreads have gone down. Um, but because we're aiming for properties, 30,000, 40,000, right. I'm not going after the 250 and making a wider spread. So all my, uh, assignment fees are anywhere from 5,000 to 15,000, which they used to be up to 28,000, you know, um, gotcha. and I want to, and I want to uh, focus more on something you just mentioned. And I want to hit on something you just mentioned earlier. And I want to make sure I'm cor uh, correct on this. Make sure I heard you correctly. You said that you're getting more sellers uh, reaching out more, you know, to you now uh, to sell their properties. Are these sellers that were already in your existing database? Did you have to spend any more money in marketing to get those leads? Or are you saying that you're getting more seller leads without spending any more money on marketing? Let me clarify that. So I am spending more money on marketing because as soon as all this happened, um, I know my South Florida seller. So South Florida is a bit of a tougher market. Uh, right away, I was like, I want to go, I want to go to the country. So that's when I started um, in like in that triad area. 
Um, and so I was reaching out to a new market. So I was opening up a new market in the middle of all this to aim for lower priced uh, properties as well. Nice, nice. So like while others are running scared, while others are not spending right now, you chose to double down on marketing, spend more money on marketing and open up another market uh, yeah. to expand. Man. Um, so th that was a mixed um, mindset, you know, that, that was a mixed mindset. So for me, again, looking at the opportunity, I was like, it's great because it's one, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to go out of business. So I'm going to be a buyer when a lot of people are closing their doors, which I do know a lot of wholesalers where they're just like, hey, listen, I just rather open up in the, in the end of the year. And that's okay, too. But for me, I knew that internally, we had a lot more organization and training to do. And that's actually what I'm spending my time on. So I'm looking at it as an investment, you know, like uh, daily, we're doing trainings now on sales. And then weekly, we're doing trainings, uh, company wide trainings. to so overall up level the team and, you know, have a better trained in real estate. So I'm kind of taking this time as well that we're not so, so busy to go ahead and train the team. So when we ramp back up, it's just going to like, it's going to run very, very smoothly. And then as awesome. far as, um, you know, like I, I mean, I didn't know that this was going to come, but I knew that the market was had to go down, you know, it's normal, it's cyclical. So I'd already had saved money for resources, um, when the market was going to go down because I wanted to, um, you know, plan for when it was going to go down so we can still be a company when it comes back up. So yeah, right now I'm hiring and, and I'm training. So you talk about your team, how many people are on your team right now? Do you have, did you have to let go of anybody at all? Or you sound, you said you're hiring right now too. So how many people are on your team and what's the morale of your team as well? Yeah. So, um, it's very, very, very interesting. I feel like, um, I don't know, there's a higher God out there. Um, right before this, all of this happened in the beginning of March, I actually had already started to cut people that just weren't making the cut anymore. Yeah. So I like three people uh, at the end of February, beginning of March. I didn't even know that this was coming. I was just like, I need to restructure and have the right people. So that was already going. Um, and then as far as, as hiring, I got back into cool calling. I think it's a really good time to catch people at home. Um, what my team consists of right now, I have only one person that's here, an acquisitions manager that is here in Miami. The rest of my people are in Colombia and I have one transactions coordinator in Venezuela. Nice. So my nice. acquisitions agent is in Bogota. Um, I just hired his sister to help us with marketing. Um, they, they do a really good team together. Um, as far as for marketing the properties, I've taught him sales. Uh, my transactions coordinator is in um, Venezuela. And um, my cold caller and my other acquisitions manager is in Bogota. So I put five people virtually, one person here in Miami. But now that I've really focused down, it's, I, it's just the same. Like it, there's, there's really no separation in between a VA and a, and a, and like, let's say a US team member, um, because I'm inputting so much into training that I'm just hiring well in Bogota as well. Like I'm hiring people that are very educated. I'm hiring people that have engineering degrees, uh, MBAs. Like I gotta be honest, a lot of my team is, does a lot better job than I would if I was in that seat. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you want to hire where you're weak, right? Your staff, your yeah. weaknesses, and uh, hire people that are smarter than you to help you uh, grow and scale your operations. So that's awesome. And so now I know you have a deal that you're closing right now in the midst of all of this. Um, yeah. Again, June times when people are focused on the negative of lenders backing out and buyers backing out, you still have deals going on. You have a deal right now that you're about to close on. You can close on it today, uh, yeah. but you're... Uh, to my understanding, you're re renegotiating to get a better price. So tell me about that deal and show us some show us some proof, Natalie. Yes, I got you. So this deal is actually, I think it's a really, really good example of everything um, for in so many ways. So uh, a little bit about this deal. So this deal, um, it came in through our marketing channel back in, I want to say February, February, March, right? This was a short sale. So when the seller called in, he already had an agent, he already had a buyer, right? 
And we were like, okay, great, you're under contract. We specialize in short sales. Let's just keep following up. Through continuous follow up, um, their deal fell apart. So if you've ever done a short sale, um, a lot of people sway like away from short sales, especially if somebody already tried it, because short sales take so long to negotiate. Um, especially if somebody already tried it and they failed. So it's like, hey, they didn't improve their offer. I'm just gonna like not for nothing. I'm gonna come in with a low ball offer and they're gonna say no to me. A lot of people sway away from the short sale. But in general, um, like it's just a company culture, like let's just still try it. We have the resources, we have the we have the infrastructure, let's still try it. So that's what we did. The sale date for this um this short sale was actually April 7th. And I remember it was about 10 days um before is that we got the file right that he had canceled out with the other agent and the other buyer and the house was going to go on auction so i called the bank phh and they were like well you can't start a short sale because it's not 30 days out you have to go ahead and get the sale extended which means i got to spend money and getting an attorney involved um and i was like yeah fine i'm still going to open up the file expect that that um that delay right the the extension on the foreclosure so I'm like getting ready all the paperwork and this coronavirus hit and the courts closed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so literally everyone in my team was like, this is a waste of time. My transaction coordinator is like, hey, they said that you need 30 days. Why are we filling out all this paperwork? You know, I'm like, we're still going to try it. I didn't know we were going to shut down. You know, this coronavirus hit and literally I think it was like, we we put it in april 1st april 2nd and the bank's uh opinion changed completely literally from like not picking up my calls not returning my phone calls back it being so difficult to being like yeah we'll send a bpo out there right away um yeah we will we'll work with you we know that the you know the policy is 30 days out but yeah we'll work with you it, it just completely changed. So short sales usually take even sometimes up to like four months to six months, right? If you're really going back and forth and the values don't make sense. I got this done. I mean, today's what? April, April 28th. We got it done in three weeks, a short sale. I was going to ask that because, yeah. because they take so long with my company, we normally just outsource short sales to a third party <laughs> negotiation. I don't have time or bandwidth to deal with that. I want to focus on the deals I can get done today. And so I work out a joint venture deal with a third party negotiation company. They handle all of the, the grunt work of dealing with the short sale negotiations and the banks. And when it's ready, the file's ready, come back to me and say, hey, we got the price, here's what it is. And then I can move forward with my next steps. Uh, but the fact that you were able to get this done so quickly, you know why? It's because in this new economy, here's what's good. Here are the strategies that are going to come back into play. Because I lived through the last recession. I was part of that. And short sales, REOs, auctions, those are the things that are going to be um, strategies and techniques you have to learn and study to prepare for what's coming. Uh, creative financing, creative buying. So creative buying and creative selling are going to be huge strategies you got to double down on and learn right now. And so I'm not surprised. In this new economy, it's not just going to be dealing with direct to seller anymore. The banks are going to become the sellers. The banks are going to become the motivated sellers and have to offload these non-performing assets uh, on their books. So the banks sees what's going on out there like, oh crap, <laughs> let's you know, accelerate these files and get them off the book. So uh, awesome, man. Awesome. I think short, actually, I have it here in my notes for next month for May, we're going to be pulling data for um, non-owner occupied pre foreclosures because the owner occupied ones, um, you know, everyone wants to stay in their house. So there's a lot of foreclosures that are vacant right now. Right. So you have the leverage of, you know, they want their money, the courts are closed, so you have the time and you have the bank helping you expedite the files because they need money, right? Nobody's making their mortgage payments right now. So yeah, it was, it was a blessing. It was a blessing in disguise. I'm going to actually look up here um, our approval so I can show you some proof. Thank you. This is good stuff. Thank you for sharing. You know, this is really good and I appreciate you sharing and be transparent as you are. Uh, right now. I have never, ever heard of a short sale getting approved in three weeks. Me neither. Me neither. That's amazing. And so for those of you watching this, 
Mark my words, short sales, uh, subject to um, owner financing, REOs, auction properties. That is what you got to learn going forward. Um, in this new market and new, new economy coming up, uh, these are the things that, um, these are the avenues, these are the areas in real estate where you're going to want to double down on. Those are where the deals are going to be. Not just the motivated sellers, not just seller direct, but those other um, sources as well, uh, as far as the banks and those sh other strategies. So what would normally work for a wholesale deal may not work for all your deals going forward, but sellers may be more open to creative financing strategies now because uh, they want to sell. They're more open-minded to those things. Um, sellers getting behind on mortgages, you know, opens up opportunities for short sales as well. Yeah, I mean, while the courts are closed, we have to milk this because, and even once they open, they have to give everyone a, they have to give everyone an extension, at least for 90 days by HUD. They're going to um, require that. Give me one. And so you're just stacking your pipeline right now. So while the courthouses are closed, you obviously can't get certain things done, but that's not stopping your idea. And correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like your idea is to just keep stacking the pipeline with deals so that when the courthouses open up, it's like, boom, I got like five, 10, 15, 20 deals ready to go right now. It's going to be a great month for you. Yeah. So, so I'm using with short sales, um, you need time, right? And that's usually why people don't do it because as you're doing a short sale, it's going out know, for auction and then you waste all your time and money into it, right? So yeah. I'm using that the bank and I'm not looking at the camera because I'm actually looking for the approval in my emails. Um, here we go. I think this is it. So, um, I'm looking, so basically I'm using this time that the bank, that the, um, courts are closed, right. To ne negotiate with the banks because they have no other option. They're not getting, they're not getting money from, from the seller. The seller already gave up on the loan. The court is not auctioning it off. Uh, so I'm like their best option right now. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. This is my short sale approval. So I, you can see here the approved sales price is 145 and they want us to close by the end of next month, which means that we just got this in. We, we, we verbally had got it in about a week ago and we just got this in um, on the 26th, so two days ago. So, so we have offers for 190. If you want, I can show you the offer too. We've been going back and forth with it. Um, we have offers for 194, and, and um, but this was pretty much pre-COVID, I feel like. So I'm going back and I'm renegotiating for 110, even if I get it for 130, 120, which I have a good feeling. I think I'm going to get it for 110. It's still a sweet deal. From oh my gosh. Right now, it's already a great deal with the buyer that you have. You're going to make, what, $45,000? Dollars, it sounds like yeah um, mm -hmm. and you feel pretty confident the bank will probably take a reduction on the 145 which will add more money to to your pockets so that's awesome yeah because when they went on did this BPO it was in the beginning of the month in the beginning of the month it was in you know kind of in the beginning wave of all this so there I have every every ground to stand on to say that the market has gone down you know since the BPO has done has come up and I have, sh I have also sales to prove it. So I'm going back for it with a value dispute. I should be getting um, noticed by the end of next week. And then we, we, are, we have two buyers right now that are interested at 190. We're just going back and forth um, on executing, whoever executes the contract first. But you know, on a bad day, it's a $45,000 $45, spread. On a good day, it's a much higher spread. So. Hopefully. This is awesome. Yeah, it's like this is awesome. You can see my company's name. Um, you can see my company's name. The approved price is one forty-five. Um, we're also in on the realtor commissions because I'm licensed as well, so I do get um, half of this half of this commission as well. And um, it was really sweet because we were able to get the seller ten thousand dollars in move out assistance as well. You know, that's the beautiful thing about this too, is, you know, you're doing deals today, you're making money today, uh, but in the coming weeks and months, and I, I say this on all the calls, because it's important for people to understand this, it's important for this to be drilled into their heads, is that um, 
you know, the situation is going to get worse, unfortunately, uh, for many Americans. Uh, lots of people file for unemployment. You can see the news and the crazy, you know, record-breaking reports on that. And so financially, there are a lot of people in a bad situation right now. And when people get into situations like this, they start offloading things. They start selling cars. They start selling jewelry. They start selling different assets. They start selling houses um, because they have to, right? They need the money. And so us as investors in our industry, we are able to help these people uh, put some money in their pockets so that they can uh, not have to stress about the burden of the debt and, and the bills that are piling up that they can no longer afford because they have no money coming in from work. Um, so you're able to help them put some money in their pockets so that they can, um, you know, move on with their lives and get themselves in a better situation, uh, in a situation that they can afford. And then you can also put some money in your pocket as well. There's nothing wrong with getting paid to uh, help and support others. Uh, so for us as real, real estate investors, this is a unique opportunity right now, right now in this climate. And like I said, as the situation gets worse, there's going to be floods of more opportunity I and mean, opportunity is just going to increase. It's huge opportunity right now. Um, and this is the time when, you know, you add another zero to your net worth. If you do it right, if you continue to educate yourself, you continue to focus uh, your efforts. Uh, this is the time where every single one of you can literally add a zero to your net worth. So uh, my good friend, Tim says, don't waste a good recession. Now is the time to, to double down. So this is good stuff, Natalie. Definitely, definitely. Um, I can Are you excited? You um, the offer for 190 that we've been going back okay. to so you can kind of see the proof as as far as that as well. And the reason, so we're I'm kind of going back and forth. The reason why we haven't really executed or completely pushed forward with an offer is because um, if I get a reduction, um, I have to restructure my B to C as well. So that's why I, I'm waiting on the bank. So I know at the end what I have to do because I, I do have um, um, a deed restriction on it for more than 120, 120%. So I'm waiting for what the end price is going to be to see how I'm going to structure the deal. Um, and with these short sales, you do have to double close on them, but you can see here. So the deed restriction, uh, can you share more about that for those newbies watching this video? Share what that is. Because I had to deal with the same thing when um, I was buying a lot of REOs in the last recession. Uh, the banks would most times put some type of resale restriction on selling the house. It could be a resale restriction on time. So they'd say, hey, you can't sell the house for X amount of days for a profit. Or sometimes they'll say, hey, you can't sell the house for $1 more than what you bought it for. And they just put all these different crazy restrictions in there, which prevented you from making money in a timely amount of time, mm -hmm. especially if you're taking down the asset and you have holding costs with loans and so forth, right? There, it, it just affects things. So uh, we were able to find workarounds to still get these deals done. And so I want you to share uh, for those watching this, video especially the new members coming into the community newbies that may be watching this video looking at this as a real estate as an option what restrictions are you talking about specifically what does that mean for you and how are you going to get around that so um so every every investor has their own their own restrictions right and the whole mindset is like if they're taking a loss on the money that they they lent out or it's not really a loss it's a tax cut then they don't want you to benefit right away that's really what it is so some some banks put restriction on the deed so when you go and um you're purchasing the property they'll put a paragraph saying uh deed restriction and then what they want you to buy by um this specific one it comes on the short sale approval we always look for it and basically it puts a restriction on how fast or how much you can sell it for so um, most of them are, you know, within 100, within 90 days, you can't sell it for more than 120%, which is the 20-90 rule is what we call it. So 
you can sell it right away, um, but it can't be more than 20%, right? Which 20% is great, right? But when you're dealing with a deal like this, 20% is like 174-ish. So that's what we're structuring on this deal um, because we have an offer for 190 and we can't sell it, right? And then I also don't want to hold the property for 90 days. I don't want to own the property for 90 days. So um, do you want me to share how we're going around this one? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. The, um, the way that we're going around this one is basically the end sales price is 190, but on the HUD, it can't say more than 174, right? Or 120%, whatever I buy it for, which is why we haven't wrapped it up. Um, so if it's 145, my approval amount, I can't sell it for more than 174. And obviously I have one, somebody offering me 190. So that's a lot of money to leave on the table, especially when it's a zero day inspection. Right. So once they're in, they're in the way that we're structuring it, we're planning on structuring it is by making a net sales contract. So they have to give me 174 net, which forces them to pay for any closing cost on top of that. And we'll push all the closing costs on their side, making our net um, sweeter, you know, better. Um, we're also putting on their side, all the realtors commissions because they did come with a realtor and I'm even taking a listing agent commission on it as well. So we're making it a net contract and then adding a lot more fees on their side where we're still collecting. Um, I think we're also going to have to put in a, um, like a project management fee that the buyer's going to have to pay um, as well to collect the full amount to get up to the 190 and the buyers don't care. I mean, they're at the end, they're getting their deal. Uh, this property is worth about one, uh, 270. So they're getting a great deal on their end. Um, they've already gone to see the property. They want it and they're buying cash. So they don't care about which way they structure it. Um, they just want to get to the one, 190 at the end of the day. Awesome. Awesome. It's pretty creative. Awesome. Good stuff, Natalie. And you were going to share the, um, so this is the sales or purchase agreement for your buyer. Yeah, this is my B2C purchase agreement. So you can see here they're offering 190. Um, this yeah. is their original offer. And the main thing that you look for is 190 and that it's zero day inspection with any deal that you, you're looking to flip. Once you have a buyer on the end, you want to make sure they're going to stay in there. Um, so we have two like this going on right now. Um, we have two offers the same. Um, but we're kind of waiting to see what reduction I get. If I get it for 110, then I have to restructure their contract, right? Yeah. And um, that's why we haven't signed a B2C yet. No, it makes sense. You'll have to add the additional fees in the, mm -hmm. the agreement. Make sure you make that additional spread. So it makes perfect sense. Man, congratulations. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. Kudos to you to have multiple buyers on the same deal, um, basically <laughs> going at it. So I, I'm assuming whoever brings, once you get the final numbers, whoever brings uh, the deposit first gets the deal, whoever can close the fastest gets the deal. And um, you have two people going at each other, uh, you know, so if one backs out, you have a backup buyer as well. And so that's amazing. And thank you for sharing this as well. So uh, with your buyer specifically, uh, from an earlier conversation, early, from, uh, from the earlier part of the conversation, you said that you reached out to all of your buyers, uh, you had conversations with all of them, found out what every single one of them are looking to buy right now in today's market. First of all, find out if they're still buying and then get clarity on it. What is their exact criteria right now? And you just honed in on what that criteria was. You started sourcing deals that met that criteria and you're bringing those deals to your buyers. What I love about wholesaling, because this is one of the strategies that works in any market cycle, as you know, is as the buyers get tighter on their buy price, as a wholesaler, you can get tighter on your acquisitions price. You just adapt as the market changes, whether it's going down or up, you just adapt with your acquisitions uh, to match what buyers are actually paying in that market on that given day, in that given time, in that moment. Yeah. It's, you know, our friend says it all the time. It's like day trading. You just adapt in real time. Um, as the market shifts, you shift. And so that's what I love about wholesaling. It's a unique strategy that works in any market cycle, as long as you have the right knowledge, as long as you know what you're doing. And thank you so much for sharing this today. Uh, proven, you know, pulling the curtain back and proven, showing the real that you are getting deals done today, right now. 
you're doubling down on your marketing, you've expanded into a brand new marketplace. Um, all, really well, all of this, huh? And it's going really well. There you go. And so you've expanded into a new marketplace, it's going well, um, even in spite of all of the negative news from the media and so forth out there, um, and people running scared, like you are doing well in this business. So uh, I think this was important to share with our community. Um, I wanted to re I want to reach out to more of our community members like you that are um, looking at this as a real opportunity. They've changed their mindset. And just like you were struggling with this in the early stages of this, um, this is why we're doing this. It's because I know others right now are struggling with, with the mindset stuff. And, and I remember, again, years ago, I did it. I, I struggled with the mindset stuff. In fact, thank God it only took you two weeks to get out of it. Natalie, it took me two years. Yeah. to get out of that mindset because I was so beaten down and I chose to remove myself from my inner circle of like-minded people that could have helped me. I became depressed and I removed myself. Unlike you, you stayed connected to our group, our community, and you're listening to these coaching calls. You're seeing what other people are doing. You're, you're asking questions, um, collaborating with other people. And so that helped to sh shift your mindset very quickly for where, where for me, it didn't because I went private. I stuck my head in the hole. I was like, this is ridiculous. And I lost two years of time. And so my hope is that this video, someone watches this video, um, even if they were scared, worried like you were, they are able to snap out of it quickly, uh, just like you were able to and not lose a year or two years or even six months or a couple of months like I did. Um, back then because my mindset was all it took for me to shift and get back in the game. That's all it was, was my mindset and the right knowledge of how to adapt to what's working today. Yeah, it's, it's all mindset. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of end with this, you know, when it comes to wholesaling, one thing that I always keep in mind, especially because we go through this even through a regular market, you know, like you only need one buyer for a property. Like you only need one. Yes. You don't need you don't need multiple yeses. You only need one yes. So if you focus in on, and that's how like I focus my team, like we only need one person to say yes. And we only need one buyer to say yes. You know, um, it really kind of clears, clears things out. And I think there's a lot of opportunity. I mean, for the people getting in, you know, the market, what it was three months ago, it was highly saturated. And like you had so many sellers that had crazy offers and and they were legit right like they were from hedge funds they were looking for people that were looking to buy and hold so they can buy higher right but all those people were cleared out right and and three months ago when you went into negotiate it's like well i got a higher offer like what do you negotiate with like well i'm i'm a real buyer and here are your comps like they're like no where's the money right nowadays like you have so many things that you can go back on like Hey, the economy, I need to buy this number because the economy is going down. I always tell them like, you know, right now I'm catching a falling knife, but I'm a real estate professional. I have to buy through the, when the market is up and when the market is down. And that's why I'm still making you an offer on the property, but I do have to buy at a price where it makes sense. Right? So it's a lot more logical decisions being made and a lot of really good um, negotiation tactics that you can use versus what the market was three months ago, where, like everybody was getting over asking price offers. And not only that, but the retail market is still going like normal. Like my my rehabs are still under contract. You know, they're just taking a little bit longer because people are working from home, but that's just a regular market that's still that's still going. I don't know for how long it'll go, um, but you know, end buyers are still buying. That was such a great point that you brought up. And I'm glad you brought it up uh, towards the end of this call uh, because it's such a good point to to really bring home the point that there's not only are there going to be more sellers in the marketplace, but it's this, this economy right now has wiped out a lot of the competition. And so there's not only more deal flow from sellers, but there's also more opportunity, you know, for you as well, because there's not that many competition or um, competitors going for the same deal. There's not a lot of, seller, oh, I'm sorry, there's not a lot of buyers making crazy, ridiculously high offers uh, with these sellers anymore. And thanks to the media in many ways, it's helping the conversation that you're having with the sellers be a lot easier as well. 
uh, to be able to get the price you need. So great, great points. And so we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap it with that. Uh, again, thank you so much for your time today. You were amazing. Congratulations on your success. And uh, I'm wishing you blessings and continued success in the future, uh, especially with your expansion into new marketplaces as well. And my hope is that your story, your case study, your uh, reveal today uh, will help to inspire others that are looking at real estate as a true opportunity for them. And for those that are actively doing real estate right now, it would inspire them to uh, double down, to really focus on what matters, uh, to get rid of all the, the noise and external forces that may be affecting their mindset and their business and realize that this is a real opportunity. Uh, focus on revenue generating tasks only. Get rid of the things that are not working in your business right now. That seems to be a common theme that I've heard from all of the people I've interviewed so far is they're tweaking things, they're innovating, right? They're looking at uh, things that are working better now and get rid of, get, getting rid of what's not working anymore. It could be deals, it could be some of their processes are not working anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the time to innovate. Uh, be lean, but stay profitable as well. So congratulations. Um, I'm super happy, super proud of you. Any final words before we leave? Um, I mean, I just hope that it, it, it inspires someone. I hope that it, it really helps, you know, somebody that's watching this to really get into real estate. And, and you know, one is the person who's, who's wanting to get in real estate. Another is really what I'm looking to reach out to is the person who's in real estate and having a really tough time that are, they're not only feeling the emotional, um, downturn but really the financial downturn right when you're running a business that's not running it's just kind of looking at it and shifting it the first thing that I did was get out of South Florida because the pro the properties are very high um and yeah and go virtual <laughs> <laughs> there you go you didn't just sit back and take it you adapted you shifted with the marketplace immediately and you got you got to do it fast so protect your mind shift and adapt quickly get rid of all the crazy high expenses and focus on revenue. Awesome. Thank you so much, Natalie. You've been amazing. I really appreciate you. All right. That's the real deal. Signing off.